Hi, I'm Mark Linsenmeyer of the Partially Examined Life Philosophy Podcast and Blog. I'm Fretjof Bergman. I am a, a professional philosopher. I taught philosophy at Stanford and at Chicago and at Berkeley and for a long time at Michigan. But I have done many other things. And very often when I get introduced, people mention that I actually also made money boxing and that I made <laughs> money with any number of things on my way. I farmed quite a number of times, actually, on my way to uh, doing a stint as a philosophy professor. But then I started to do other things. And for many years now, I have worked on what is called new work. Here, we just want to give a, a short, basic introduction to it. What I want to impress today is that the job system is a social problem. That's usually not something that we, when we're listing, a, a, you know, what are the society's ills that we need to address? You'll get poverty, you'll get unemployment. But, you know, the fact that we have jobs is a good thing, right? That's how we get money. That's, uh, you know, it gives us a sense of belonging. It gives us something to do. But... Uh, according to this uh, new work viewpoint, the problems of poverty, of unemployment, really of overall job dissatisfaction, which a lot of people have, are endemic. They're, they're systemic problems that normally if somebody's right now unhappy with their job, you just say, you know, that's an individual problem. You need to explore other career options. You need to get more training. You need to do something like that. You might say, oh, well, there's maybe not so many other options in the thing that you're doing because the uh, the employment landscape is not so good right now, so maybe the government has to pump money into uh, revving the economy up to create more positions or something like that. But uh, the, the, the toolbox of solutions uh, is pretty narrow in terms of what we conceive. Either it's, it's uh, you know, let the, the job system, let the economy go as it's been, as it efficiently provides goods for all of us, or it's have big government step in and do something and they'll probably screw it up. That, 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 that Those seem to be the only solutions that we have. Uh, but Fritjof has been working with this for, what, 35 years now? Almost 35 years. Yes, of alternatives to the job system, not just as a, as a thinker, but actually going into places like Detroit and uh, India and South Africa and, and prisons and Native American populations and quite a few uh, places around the country, mostly that have, the, their major job problem is that there are no jobs around there, but also with Silicon Valley executives and other folks that just, you know, aren't finding what they're doing particularly meaningful, uh, are, are, are trying to, d to devise alternatives to the expectation that, you know, what you do with your, your full time, your non-sleeping time is make a living that that's that's what we all have to do and we've had so much technology that should that has you know gotten rid of so many jobs these labor saving devices that they should actually save some labor should free up some time so that then we could have the time to to explore and pursue more meaningful work in the rest of our time so it's it's decoupling the idea of a job on the one hand which is a social creation uh, designed really to generate goods to generate services and it's done you know the, the economy has, has now we, we have more goods than we know what to do with uh, but on the other hand there's no reason to think that a system like that created to use us as its tools in creating these things should also be the, the sum total of human fulfillment uh, there's no reason to think that those things are coupled but yet work you know doing a project that really means something to you can be enormously fulfilling and that's something that is worth pursuing as a society maybe it's worth mentioning by way of establishing a way of talking to each other that i uh, did teach at stanford not for very long but at the point at which google was just beginning and also uh, apple was just beginning and to some extent People listen to the lectures I was given then. And also, I have worked a great deal as a consultant to many different companies in quite a number of different countries. So I don't come into this discussion quite unprepared. Uh, let me get to the central point, which is that the job system is not the only way of organizing work. On the contrary, 
the job system is the way of organizing work that we have put all the emphasis and all the hopes on in the last 200 years. That is, the job system was only invented, was only created around the time of the Industrial Revolution, so roughly 200 years ago. And very importantly, prior to that, people worked in radically different ways. And to make that vivid and concrete, most people, even now, in many countries, that's still the case, worked at farming. And I myself was a farmer three times in my life. And the working as a farmer is as different from working in a factory as one can imagine. It's in every respect different. And so it is a different work system. And that's the crucial term that is for my way of looking at or for the people who associate with new work, and that even explains the term new work, the idea is a work system that is not the job system, but that is a different new work system, fundamentally different in its design, in its structure, in its intention, but it is a way of organizing work, which, if you think about it for a moment, it's actually not so difficult to understand. That is, even in the beginning, uh, when the job system first came in, uh, there were many people, some very important in American history, Jefferson maybe being the best known one, who at that point, uh, roughly 200 years ago, now said the job system bowed ill. That is, they shook their head. They were skeptical. They thought that the transition from agricultural work to job work uh, probably would result in a whole set of calamitous consequences. And that is very much the picture we now have. That is our view is that in the last 200 years, which is the duration of the job system. It hasn't existed longer. It's actually therefore a relatively young and short-lived uh, structure. Uh, the ills, uh, the disadvantages, the, I sometimes use words like the, uh, the uh, tsunamis of, uh, that the job system has created have grown tremendously, so much so, and that's an absolutely crucial point, that it does make sense, even though it may at first be a little bit startling to say, no, it is not enough, given the tsunamis we have, uh, it is not enough to tighten this little screw or turn this a little bit or increase that expense or speed up that or put a little bit more emphasis on the other thing. That is not enough to fix the problems. The problems are enormous, are endemic, are systemic, are epidemic. And therefore, we now say, okay, we have worked for quite some long time with many other people on the idea of a dramatically new work system. Now, let me quickly say the main, main calamities uh, that uh, we see in connection with the job system, the most obvious big, big one is what I call sometimes the butcher split. That is the split between the ever increasing number of poor people and they are increasing in spite of some um, newfangled ways of trying to cover that up. That poverty in India, poverty in China, poverty in Russia has not really in decreased. And uh, on the other side, and that we are all ex plenty familiar with, the number of wealthy people is also growing, but most importantly, their wealth has gone through the roof and has skyrocketed. And the split between poor people and rich people has become a scandal, or has become a calamity, or has become a social disease, or has become something where I would become a little bit aggressive and say, no, 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 this is not just some kind of moral problem, but this is dangerous. Uh, I spent time in North Africa when the so-called spring was happening in North Africa. And it's obvious 
that in all kinds of countries, people are in the process of rebelling, are getting ready to rebel more. Uh, all of Africa is in some state, some condition of arming itself for the rebellion that is necessary in order to get Africa out of the sand dune or out of the sand hole in which Africa is drowning. So, uh, to our mind, you know, what is happening is that a very large part of humanity is arming itself into for a war that will happen between the rich and the poor. And so it's not just a moral problem. We need to do something in order to avert the coming and maybe the ultimate defeat in this war. But the split between poverty and wealth is only one of the epidemics. Uh, we take the view that the financial crisis that some people pretend has been overcome and people even talk of sort of the recession that is behind us. Frankly, I think that is ludicrously mistaken. Whatever we experienced and whatever we now experience is not a recession. A recession is something that was connected and that only grew out of the whole idea of cyclical economics. And what we now have has nothing whatever to do with cyclical economics. The three main causes of the current crisis or of the current calamity uh, is the three main causes are one, automation. That is not a cyclical phenomenon, but on the contrary, it is a steadily increasing phenomenon. Secondly, globalization, again, not a, a cyclical phenomenon, but something that is steadily increasing. And thirdly, and oddly, that is very often not mentioned when one talks about what has gone wrong and what needs to be fixed. To my mind, the third in these, and maybe the biggest one, is the migration away from farms. That is, uh, until not that long ago, something close to 80% of the population was working on farms, and that was their job. So 80% had a job that was farming. But farming has become unworkable uh, on a small farm. What's left a huge agricultural enterprises, agricultural businesses, agricultural industries, but they employ very few people. And so what has happened? And if one wants to have any picture at all of what we are actually experiencing now, one must put into that picture that millions and millions and millions of people in every country you may name, and that includes countries like the United States, right in the Middle West, uh, are migrating away from farms. You can drive through empty uh, villages if you are in Nebraska or wherever. And the point is that these people very often have moved into the cities. Detroit is maybe the most scandalous example of that. And for a while had jobs in uh, the, the cities to which they migrated. But in many, many cases, the farmers that move into the cities end up unemployed, end up in a, in, you know, a situation of corruption, uh, drugs, prostitution, etc., all of that. These are the cliches that we associate with that. So I'm saying the migration away from farms is one of the most, uh, one of the largest, one of the most momentous developments that we need to think about and that we need to respond to. We, we cannot simply say, okay, so we'll make the economy run a little bit faster and we'll put a little more oil on the wheels that are already screeching. It won't do because the numbers are wrong. The numbers are enormous. I mean, it was not long ago, 80% of all people worked on farms. Now, the statistics roughly are that 4% of all people work on farms. So that gives one a sense of the magnitude of what we are up against. There are other things that can be mentioned in this, like the financial crisis, like the, the entrepreneurial crisis, simply that we produce too much, very much and very, very importantly for new work. Also, the fact that speeding up the economy, constantly making the economy grow in order to create more jobs has resulted in 
the, the, the disasters having to do with natural, uh, with, with nature, with resources, with the whole green problem. And so we include the problem of the environment in the things that the job system has witnessed upon us. And this may be now a cardinal thought that may help people to pull this together and to understand it and to put it into get a grip on it. That is, new work is an attempt, a long lasting attempt that has already gone on for something like 30 years to create a fundamentally different structure in which work is organized, a fundamentally different set of values, a fundamentally different way of, of, of con conceiving what work is all about. It is that and it is that sort of in two directions. One direction is because the job system in the last stretch is responsible for all of the diseases, all of the calamities with which we are witness. So on the one side, the job system is response, is the devil in the picture. The job system has caused everything that is bad. But to our mind, a, a new work system, the new work system on which we work, is also the, the way up so that we are not just trying to somehow ameliorate things. We are not just trying to make it less bad. But on the contrary, the idea is we start from scratch, we do something dramatic, and that means we develop a new system where work will be different, where the economy will be different, where the culture will be different, but where in all respects we will have a much more intelligent, a much more cheerful, a much more productive, a much more humane system than we have now. So there is the two-sidedness is crucial for an understanding of new work, that we on the one side see six or seven uh, enormous e evils uh, like uh, great waves like tsunamis coming towards us, that's the one side. The other side is that with intelligence, with imagination, with innovation, we can not just avert this and postpone it, but we can create a new different, a new system of work and of culture and of production that will be infinitely, incomparably more humane and more satisfying than the one under which we have suffered in the last 200 years. So this optimistic, this positive, this utopian dimension is very much part of new work. On the one side, get rid of the evil that has be, is besetting us. On the other side, in the process of getting rid of this evil, create the basis for something vastly more desirable than we have now. Now, I can, in very few minutes, give a, an idea of where this goes, but and I would say, no, no, it's not that difficult to understand, but it does take a little time to understand. But very quickly, um, the uh, perhaps most important quick step into understanding an economy that would be different from the economy we have now and that is difficult for most people to in any way grasp. Could we really have a different economy? Is a different economy not only more of the same from what we have now? Is a really different economy at all imaginable? Is it thinkable? What would it be like, a really different economy, a different economic system? And there are two quick steps that give one at least the first idea of what a different economy would look like. One is the concept of miniaturization. Take your phone. Uh, how many functions are placed into the thing that you can hold in the palm of your hand that is your iPhone or your whatever it was in the past? And it's, of course, enormous. You know, our capacity to miniaturize, that is, to actually do... You know, put things into very, very small dimensions and have things that in the past were enormously large become ever smaller and smaller and work in smaller and smaller dimensions, but work very effectively in these small dimensions. That's one step, one idea, one flash 
that can, can give one a first impression of, aha, we are not condemned, so to say, into a, a steady, ever increasing, ever more alarming growth that everything has to become still bigger and still more centralized and still more oppressive and still more centralized in the sense that the, the, the split between rich and poor grows ever more bloody and ever deeper. But on the contrary, maybe there is hope in the idea of micro, in, in, in sm making things smaller. That's one point. Uh, the other point, the second point that helps one to gain a footer, to gain a first idea of what a different economy might look like, is a critique of the concept of mass manufacturing. It's odd that uh, that is actually a fully developed literature, but most people are very unaware of the fact that mass manufacturing is problematic that mass manufacturing is not the inevitable and obvious way of manufacturing to which no alternative is conceivable. No, it's different. Mass manufacturing is in many ways not the most efficient way to manufacture, but on the contrary, is an extremely problematic way to manufacture. And to make that concrete and specific and vivid, roughly, of anything whatsoever that you go and buy, whether this is lipstick or whether this is a car, the actual value of what you are buying is only 20% of what you are paying. That is what it took to manufacture the lipstick or what it took to manufacture the furniture or the washing machine or the car or whatever it is that you are about to buy. Actually, it required only 20% to make this. It was relatively cheap and inexpensive to make it what was added onto it was due to mass manufacturing, which, by which I mean mass manufacturing involves the addition of uh, the uh, involves the addition of uh, transportation, of uh, advertising, uh, of of selling. There is a whole long ch chain of things that are included or that re are required, that are added to the process of actually making something, which it makes mass manufacturing much less efficient than we very often think. So th let me try to say this once more. That is, mass manufacturing is a, f a form of manufacturing where, of course, there is the manufacturing part. But in mass manufacturing, much else is added on to it. And that makes um, mass manufacturing problematic and questionable. And that is now crucial for the understanding of new work and of a new economy, of a new concept of economy. Because what we have developed is the idea of, uh, we used to call it high-tech self-providing, but we now use the term community production, that is, it is possible using the micro that the, the, the diminishment in size that has become possible, it is now possible to manufacture in small units, in small rooms, in small spaces, almost everything that one needs and one doesn't need anymore. Large factories and large factories are a matter of the past and are not the most efficient way to produce but the most efficient way to produce is in small spaces and small rooms. Uh, the, the vivid example, the picturesque, the, 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 the pocketbook uh, e exemplification of that is, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, the phone and other things like that. But the point is that, for example, last year we manufactured in uh, in Austria, in the town that is most famous for automotive manufacturing in Austria, we produced an electric motorcycle that was built by very small organizations. There were only about 12 people involved in the manufacturing of that motorcycle, which all of us agreed was cool and which was a great success and was hailed in Austria as a world f first and a great breakthrough. But to us, this is only one example. The idea is a whole new economy can be built around these 
first steps in the direction of an economy in which everything is produced on site, in which things are produced in a fashion that we call community production, that is, they are made by the people in the community and in small rooms with very small devices, with very small machines, with very small uh, sort of uh, surrounding apparatus. And, and that gives a first idea, an image of what a next economy could be like, an economy not in the direction of ever more centralization, but in the direction of the opposite direction, decentralized, dis disseminated. Many, so to say, we now have reached the point, I'm trying to make this last point as vivid as I can, we have now reached the point where in any village, in any farm, we can produce uh, anything from uh, cars down to phones, down to washing machines, down to furniture, down to bricks. Bricks have recently made quite a head, made, have sort of created something around that that's possible. We don't need cement factories anymore. There are other ways of making bricks that don't require factories. That gives you some idea of what the, the manufacturing part of new work would be like. In addition to that, that's only the first step. There is that other way of manufacturing. There is that other uh, economic system. We talk about a different economy. We talk about a different organization of work. And we talk about a different culture. The different organization of work, the most crucial part of that is that work can become something where we use the word polarity. Work in the last 200 years has exhausted people, has drained people, has discouraged people, has demented people, has done dreadful things to very large numbers of people. Uh, work could become, and there's the word polarization, something that for many people, not everybody, but for many people, would be the best experience on their life. Now, uh, one sentence that comes to mind is that sex has to be very good to stand the competition with really good work. Really good work can be the very best thing, the most three things. It can give you energy instead of take energy away from you. It can give you a sense of purpose instead of make you feel meaningless and without purpose. It can give you work, if it work is work that you really seriously want to do, then work can become also on top of giving you strength and on top of giving you energy, it can give you life. If you feel that you're not really living, doing work that you really want to do can become something that makes you feel, ah, I have started to be alive because I'm doing something that I really believe in, that I want to do, that ex excites me. That's now become possible. Using the, the most recent technologies, that is what work can become, and that is the essence of new work. Well, thanks, Rashad. Well, that really laid out uh, most of the pieces here. A uh, lot to chew on, so there's a uh, provocation. I know there's some... Uh, economic experts on this site that uh, we'd love to engage a little more in some of the theory behind, you know, why economists might, uh, how Fritjof's story here dovetails with what various economists of the conservative and liberal stripes, um, you know, are predicting about uh, automation, about world poverty, all that kind of stuff. Also, uh, I imagine a lot of liberal advocacy groups of various sorts, you know, environmental uh and otherwise, we'll see a lot of touchstones uh, with what Fritjof was talking about. I think in our last couple minutes here, I just want to lay out a couple things that uh, new work is not. <laughs> just to, that there are some very obvious misconceptions that, that jump to mind. W one thing, one of, one of your most memorable uh, things from when I was taking classes with you in uh, back in the University of Michigan in the early 90s, Fritjof, was that you said that if uh, if you think a violent revolution is necessary to achieve your 
your political aims, then, then something's gone wrong with your thinking, that, that you're not thinking subtly enough, that even though you're talking about a new culture, a new economic system, there's nothing in that that says that, you know, democracy needs to go away or anything like that. There, you know, some, uh, in fact, this, this solution of community production is really a market solution uh, to, to the, the job issue that, uh, you know, if not right now, then certainly within our generation. So somebody who already has a job um, and maybe feels that they uh, are not being fulfilled, they want to work fewer hours, but there's, there's maybe not enough opportunities. Uh, well, the idea is you could use this community production, this high textile providing, to make a lot of the things that you otherwise would buy now. So you need less money, and then you can get away. You get more leverage versus your employer. You can you can work. You know, find a situation where you can afford to work fewer hours, and just you know, the more people that do this, then the more uh, the the power balance shifts between big corporations that every government has to say, please come and uh, you know, we'll beg you to offer a few more jobs, and they you know, it's, it's, it's really a tremendous waste of government money in terms of the the number of jobs created. Uh, per the uh, amount that's lost from tax breaks and other things. And of course, it's states competing against each other, community, communities competing against each other. It's, it's a really a, a, a losing game for, for just about all involved. Um, so there's nothing, uh, you know, the, the political, I think the, we can separate out in some ways the job system and how this should be reformed from should there be political reforms that go with that? Those are really two different questions. That there's nothing inherently, you know, it's great. Uh, somebody, when we had done our podcast about this, said, oh, this is just, a, you know, the things that Fritjof are recommending is just warmed over anarchism. You can le read a lot of anarchist literature that recommends these very same things. That's great if you see those connections and those, you know, that's a cause that you're in favor of. By all means, jump on board and uh, see if, if new work is something that you can contribute to that you can uh, incorporate these ideas into your own thinking and your own projects. But, you know, I think what Fritjof is, is suggesting is organizationally, in some ways, more modest, more actually doable, more politically feasible than certainly anything like anarchism. And we can't go into it now, but, you know, when Fritjof was young, he was a, a, a Marxist. Uh, but then seeing the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union and really just what things were like even before the fall of there, uh, how it really wasn't working, that really socialism and uh, capitalism have the same problem with jobs. They don't, they still equate this, this, you know, the meaning of a person's life. What we're supposed to do is to get a job, which is mostly somebody else telling you what to do. And that's what you have to do to make a living. That there's, that those are things that were common to both, uh, systems and that socialism had you know a lot of issues in terms of you know just actually getting things done that made it uh, problematic in a lot of ways so that so what what is being suggested here is you know there, there are lots of touch points to things you know uh, Karl Marx was uh, talked a lot about uh, having work that you're uh, that you identify with that you're engaged with uh, unalienated work that's really what Fritjof is arguing for but Again, there's this difference between can you actually make the thing a job now into unalienated work? Probably not for most people. Or can you somehow marginalize that so that you're spending, you know, two hours of your day in a traditional job that you get some income from, and then another two hours a day engaged in this community production? So you're actually helping to, you know, grow your own food, create, uh, manufacture your own products. And I know that sounds crazy. You know, I don't want to go out and work in a garden or something, but there, and there are lots of ways, it's not necessarily that everybody would be doing all these things, but that, that more of what you would be doing in that respect to, to get the things you need would be working for yourself in a group to, to create these things. Um, and then the rest of your time would be working on, you know, at least for a lot of people would be working on a, something that's often called a calling, right? This, this work that is truly meaningful that, you know, Obviously, there still need to be people dealing with the garbage. That could be a job work. That's not going to be somebody's calling. But once that's out of the way, I mean, think, or, or once this high-tech uh, self-providing, this uh, community production is out of the way, you should still have a substantial amount of time left to 
pursue these great projects. And there's not an assumption that everybody is an artist or know, you know, has a burning passion that if only I didn't have a job filling my time right now, I would know what to go out and do. And I really want, you know, there are a lot of people that have dreams like that. In fact, if you've never gotten to seriously explore those dreams, they could be profoundly misconceived <laughs> that we really have to, it's a practical problem and, and one that, that Fritjof and his various new work projects, new work centers has been dealing with for these many years of, of, uh, of, of how to help people figure out what they really, really want to do, how, how to, uh, that, that finding a calling like this is an ongoing process that, you know, just because somebody uh, thinks they want to be a rock star doesn't mean that this is a well thought out goal that will uh, sustain them as their calling for their life that, uh, you know, we, we all have the capacity to have uh, multiple sort of dreams, things we get energy out of this sort. And in fact, for most people, it's not that when you when you ask them questions like this, is they want to be, they want to write symphonies, they want to be rock stars. It's that they end up uh, wanting to do something moral, something of service to people, something that is meaningful in that sense. So that's a uh, you know, even if you've got something like the uh, the what Switzerland is considering now in terms of providing a basic minimum income for everybody, which is essentially decouples the making a living, right, supporting yourself from a job, that's a good step. But that's not enough by itself. That I mean, if you just uh, fulfill uh, needs like that uh, and then leave people with no direction, then you know you're going to get a lot of uh, lying around and alcoholism and watching a lot of TV. That there really has to be an active civic project to engage with this idea of what is meaningful work and help people figure out what they want to do with this this time that they have. Do you have any uh, last words to add? Uh, maybe just one point quickly. Uh, namely, I think it was very important to, for the understanding of new work to understand that Marxism did not solve the problem of work. That on the contrary, I spent time on the other side of the Iron Curtain and the experience for me was like the experience of the death of God. That is, I was appalled by how discouraged, how very, very uh, alienated from their work people in Russia and in the communist countries feel. So the idea of socialism is, to my mind, a profound mistake. It does not solve the problem of how to make work something wonderful. That is what sort of said, left over for new work to really solve the problem of work and turn work into something exciting and exhilarating and life-giving. That did not happen under socialism.